boxing matches? December Sunday, December the first, two thousand and nineteen. We're in the in the we are in the home stretch for the year of twenty nineteen. Oh. Thank God. Thank God. Thank God. Twenty nineteen has been rough. Been a big year of boxing, though. Yeah, it's been a, it's been a really good year. Big year, good year. A lot of things changed. A lot of upsets. A lot of upsets. A lot of. A little bit of controversy. Too much controversy. Yeah. More, um, more that we're gonna talk about later. A lot of money passing in envelopes under tables. Yes, sir. <laughs> okay, so why don't you kick us off, bro? Um, All right. So it's, it's today, is Sunday, December first. We are about 24 hours removed from. Um, let's see. We're gonna talk about first about the fights that took place in the UK yesterday. It had been about midday our time. Um, the uh, what was it? The WBO. WBO bantamweight. Uh, WBO bantamweight championship. Uh, in Birmingham, England, Zolani Tete versus um, Casimeros, Jean Rio Casimeros. Uh, major, I guess you would call it a major upset, considering Zolani Tete was really highly touted about, you know, as the guy that could potentially give, um, in a way, some competition at 118 pounds. Ah. Um, and if I was, if, if I'm correct too, didn't um, um, Casimeros did he step up a division? Couple divisions. Two. Well, he started his he started his career, I believe, at one twelve, from one twelve to one fifteen to one eighteen. So technically, yeah, he jumped two divisions, but it's a matter of six pounds. Yeah. But you know, as the as the as the descend in weight, the the difference, the disparity between the weight classes gets a lot smaller. Yeah. So um, so anyways, so so I mean, what is your takes on on that fight? What did you see? You know, I think I think uh. A lot. What I what right off the bat was was to me Tete just kind of came out very. Um, you you made a comment earlier about being kind of arrogant, and he he just he really showed absolutely no respect for his opponent, in a sense to where, um, like you said, a little overconfident. Um, he got caught with some shots earlier. I think where the 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 kid from the Philippines did himself justice was being being patient. You know, he didn't go in there and just start blasting big punches on Tete. Because, I mean, let's get it right. I mean, um, Zolani does have a big punch. And um, yeah. the thing was, is when he did hit uh, Tete, um, he never recovered. That that shot to the temple. And it was. I looked at it a few times. It was like a shot right to the side of the head to the temple. Kind of a downward motion. And he just never recovered. But if, if, if I'm correct in saying this, he hit Zolani... On his right temple, yeah, and even though from the South Paul says, what I noticed, and, and honest to God, I mean, I, I literally was, I literally was typing on my phone. I was tweeting because for the first two rounds, I saw Zalani Tete just jabbing, using the jab, using the jab, and I saw the Filipino kid going to his right. He kept circling to his right, circling to his right, which which automatically you think, okay, you're going right into his power hand, yeah, the straight yeah. left. But I said to myself, and I was about to type it, I said he needs to step to his left and throw the right hand. I don't care if he throws it to the body or, or upstairs. And as soon as he took one half step to the left, threw a right hand, that was it. Zolani ducked down this way a little bit, and it caught him on that temple. Yep. And that was he never recovered. That shot put him down, and he never recovered. And I'm not going to say it wasn't a devastating shot, but it did, wasn't, the it eye wasn't test, about it any. Like, it wasn't about any uh, shot. I, that was my other going to be my other take, and I don't mean to interrupt, but. I saw a lack of heart on Zolani. I know he didn't recover from that shot, but I didn't see He looked that. like he didn't want to continue. He, he got up, like, and he didn't look like he didn't want to continue. No, he didn't look like he wanted to at all. I mean, he looked like it was almost kind of like, eh, so so be it, you know? He kind, mm -hmm. and honestly kind of remind me like he had that look on, the same look on his face that Axeman Walters had in his bout against Lomachenko. Yeah, but but at least with, with Axeman, you got to give him credit. He did last a number, yeah. a number of rounds before that. Yeah. So. Yeah. How, how long was how, how long was Zolani? How long was he off? Because I know there was. Some they said he was out of the ring for probably. Well, well, it wasn't quite a year, but he he had had a fair amount of time out of the ring. Yeah, I have to go back. I have to go to box Rec and look, but I think he was out of the ring for a little while. And of course, he was supposed to fight Donaire, right? And then he pulled out of the Donaire fight with a with a shoulder injury. Was it his right shoulder? No, that's injury? right. He did pull out because he was in the Super Six. He was in Super Six, and you know, based on what I saw, and and the performance that uh, Donaire put put on against the monster, I think Donaire would have had easy pickings with with Tete, and I think well, it I could think, have been a devastating knockout. Well, Donaire was at the fight, and I'm pretty sure Donaire 
he was looking at it this way that depending on no no Donaire was in Vegas. Oh, that's right, that's right, that's right. Donaire was in Vegas. We'll he talk he, about he that was one afterwards. Yeah, but um, I'm sorry. I'm <laughs> so <laughs> I really don't have much more to say other than I think the kid. Um, I, I want to get. I want to say his name right. You're you're so much better at names. He well, he's he he's he's got well his his name is John Real Casameros. Casameros. Um, Filipino kid who, who apparently just I think just not just shortly before the fight took place he had he had made an agreement with with Sean Gibbons to uh, to represent Manny Manny Pacquiao's promotional team on his trunks. I don't necessarily know if he was technically signed to Manny Pacquiao's promotion. He had, he had promotion, the big thing on the back of it, yeah. But I know he was a, yeah. He's a stablemate of um, the kid we talked about uh, last week, Romero Duno. Oh, okay. We worked they okay. worked together and stuff, so. I was glad to see the kid win. You know, he came out there, and he, you know, you gotta remember, he's a guy that's won two world titles, but at a lower, lot of lower weight. Yeah, and, stuff, and these so. guys kind of flown under the radar. I, I, I vaguely remember him, and I go, yeah, but he's a guy, you know. But then again, that weight division doesn't have a lot of fanfare, but as of late, it has. Yeah. And the last fight I saw him in was when he lost to um, the, the 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 kid from Thailand, um, the one who beat um, Freddie Roach's boy, um, the the Olympian. Uh, oh, Jushamin? Jushamin. Uh What was his okay. name? Uh, his last name begins with, the, with an R. Uh, like Rondo Day or Amon Rondo, something like that. Or Yeah, we have to go back and look yeah, at it. Well, yeah, well, that was the last time I saw him fight. And um, But, I mean, the thing was, like I said, I mean, the kid did what he had to do. He kind of puts himself in the mix now, so you got to look at what's the possibility is going to be out there. I mean, obviously, yeah. you know... Um, we, we know that Donaire will be. Make, I'm sorry, not not Donaire, but we know that um, Anoue is going to be making his debut in, on on U.S. soil under the banner of Top Rank. That might be a while because, based on what I heard, is he did receive a, a orbital bone or a facial fracture during the Donaire fight, and also I believe multiple. He uh, had a fractured nose not as just, well. Not just a fractured nose; he had multiple fractures within his orbital. But you know, it's it's not uncommon, and and I'm and I'm, I'm not being trying not to be political politically incorrect here but um with a lot of asian fighters i know especially in korean fighters if you look back even to some of the tragic ones i have with dooku kim a lot of them do suffer a lot of facial fractures because of their shape of their face and the high their high cheekbones and um, yeah well, that's very yeah it's very prominent cheekbones yeah yeah so what happened was um like remember joe you remember joe hip do you remember joe hip oh yeah he, the native american with those high cheekbones he would consistently cut cut no matter time. who he fought, he would consistently cut. Yeah. His his cheekbones were like razor blades. But I don't right. think that I don't think that Donaire dropping those bombs on, you know, on Anoy, and I don't want to get back on that. We already talked about it. Um, helped anyways, but um, it's going to set up some good possible. You know that 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 division's going to lighten up a little bit. But I, I was just really disappointed. I'll be honest with you. On my part, I was very disappointed in Tete and and how. I mean, here's a guy. I thought he was going to come out more explosive, and he didn't. He just kind of. He, like you said, he looked very arrogant, and he got caught. Yeah, like maybe he just figured out, just control this guy for with a yeah. jab for a few rounds, get some rounds in, and when I want to put my foot on the gas, I'll I'll step up. But you know, hey, you know, let's talk about the shot. let's talk about the exciting fight. Okay, let's move on to the, okay. I, I'll have to say this though, and I know there was a DAZN card also that took place um, in Rio oh, Carlo. Oh. Let me let me talk about the DAZN fight. Because I, I, I personally, I had no really interest in watching that card, so I didn't watch it. Probably one of the worst. I mean, I, I don't I don't want to down any card, but, I mean, every fight was a snoozer. I mean, and, and we'll talk, maybe we'll talk at the end about Cecilia Breakus, but, oh my God, dude. It took, it took everything. I mean, I was about ready to drink six Red Bulls just to save and watch that fight. That's how bad it was. <laughs> but I know DeZone had a card going on, but like I said, we'll stick to the top rank one. And obviously we had Frampton. Come back okay, so that's what I wanted to say. So basically, of the three promotions, the three the three different options you had of watching fights that night, Top Rank definitely put on a great card. All, the, all even the undercards were great, or, or or you know better than good. So the first Arnold fight, Barboza fought. yeah, Arnold, Arnold Barboza looks good. Um, he fought um, um, Arnold Barboza. As you know, he's a kid right here from South Amani. He um, he's a local kid. He's uh, you know. Arnold's 27 years old now, so he's kind of on the fast track, and I think he's 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 right in line for a title shot at 140 sometime early in the spring, probably of 2020. Um, maybe potentially. 
that kid Silva's that he fought, is that the same one who fought against Teofimo? That That's the same kid that lost to Teofimo. Okay. Yeah. So, um, so for the main card, so those fights were on, on, on ESPN Plus, and in the main card, the first opening bout of the main card, I believe, was um, was it the Frampton fight first, or was it to Teixeira fought first? To Teixeira fought first. Teixeira versus uh, uh, Carlos Adamas. So Adamas. Patrick Teixeira, who his last fight, uh, he was on the undercard of Mugia and Monterey against Dennis Hogan. Did not look particularly good in that fight. I was talking to somebody about that just this morning, and they were saying he remembers that fight. They yeah, were there in Monterey for that fight, and, and he did not look good in that fight. But he kind of went back and retooled, and and in that fight, it was God, it was it was a little bit frustrating to watch it because whenever he would stand his ground and let his hands go, I mean, I mean, he was letting his hands go, but he was letting his hands go from from a defensive position, always backing up, flicking the jab, and moving and moving. And you kept saying to yourself, every time this guy stands flat footed and just lets his hands go, he's getting to Adamas and he's actually hurting Adamas. He dropped him in that round. I don't remember what round that was, but he dropped him, and then he just seemed to let him off the hook right at the start well, of that Robert next Bird, round because well, he was Bird. still on. Robert Bird didn't help with that situation with his 27 second, you know, you know, he when Dom when um Carlos got dropped, he got up. Robert Bird, you know, obviously, you know, he made sure that um Teixeira was in Teixeira. His, was was in the um the furthest neutral corner. He comes over and he and he called for Adamas three times to come to him. Three different occasions. He told him, Come to me. Adamas didn't move. And then he finally did. Then he turned around, and looked at Teixeira again. I mean, I was yelling at the screen. I was like, "Well, because that was vital time." I mean, uh, Carlos was seriously hurt at that point, and I'm sure yeah. Teixeira would have came in and finished him at that point, but he didn't get the opportunity because then the bell rang. Yeah. You know, once again, another, I hate to say it, but another bad job by Robert Byrne. Yeah, and ultimately, the, the fight did come down to the cards, and Teixeira did win. He he did win a. a, a he did win the decision, so he technically is the interim WBO 154-pound champion. I think he's just interim and waiting because I think everybody knows Mungia is going to officially vacate probably really soon. So, hey, Mike, um, on that real quick, why don't you kind of explain for people that maybe don't understand how the interim title works? Well, 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 basic, well basically, the, with Adamus and Teixeira, both those guys were kind of in line for a shot at Mungia. And with the with Jaime now moving up to 160 to fight on um, to take on uh, Spike O'Sullivan. He technically is still on paper the 154-pound champion for the WBO, but once I believe he makes it official and he and he, and he officially vacates that title, then the interim champion becomes elevated. So technically, that was a title fight, which is why they went 12 rounds. And it was so, actually. A but really based good. on based on what I saw, and I, I want your opinion on that too. Based on what I saw, either one of those guys gets. Annihilated by Jaime Munguia. I, I, if if I either agree. one of those guys would have would have managed to get the shot against Munguia, Munguia just hits too hard for those guys, and especially Adamas. Adamas is a tough guy, but Teixeira doesn't exactly have the I think Adamas, hardest spot, and he was hurting. I think Adamas, Adamas uh, uh, Carlos fighting against a guy like Munguia, it would have turned into one of the those tragic situations that we've had way too much this year in 2019. Um, he didn't look good based on the punishment he took from Tashira. I know he was emotional, but I didn't like how unsteady he was on his legs when he was walking out of the ring and how he was kind of being assisted. For a moment there, I almost thought that, oh, God, I hope this kid's not going to collapse. Like yeah. another like, like Dadashev case where, exactly. where he was taking some shots, and even though they weren't really, really hard, they didn't the look hard. It was the accumulation. Yeah. So sure he's not a monstrous puncher, but if that kind of, if he had that kind of effect on Adamas based on that performance, Mugia's punches, it could have I mean, honestly, I mean, I think Robert Garcia needs to go home and, and be happy that he wasn't fighting Mugia because he probably would have been retiring a fighter the next following day. You know, very possible, possible. yeah, That's very possible. Probably. I mean, I think a lot of people are going to sleep a lot better knowing Mungia is going up to the middleweight. I know there's people out there that hate on Jaime, but, you know, we're going to see. You know, I'm excited about him going to the middleweight division. But, and I think those extra six pounds are going to make a huge difference. I really do. I, I just really do. I just think he just I, – I personally know we both have witnessed firsthand what he had to do to make weight all those uh, for the last year and a half. And um, he's not going to have to do that. He'll still have to make weight, but he's not going to have to make weight more. In fact, I saw a video – 
Um, just recently, uh, Renee Moreno, who's a, who's a good friend of his, another profiler showed me a video of, of um, uh, Jaime working out in Mexico, and he's he's already down to 175. So he's you know we're still we're still several weeks away from that fight in San Antonio. So he's, he's going to be right on point path, for 160. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. But um, getting already at 175. Okay. So that's good. And you know, like I said, right, let's move, let's, yeah, let's move. I'm let's sorry, get back, let's get back on. We got off track again a little bit, but um, so we were talking about uh, Teixeira and Adamus. Like I said, I mean, uh, so give me your final take on that fight. Well, final take was it was a good workmanlike performance from Teixeira. It was one of those fights that was a little bit frustrating. It, and to me, it was it was it was almost like a like a precursor to what we saw in the main event on that card, and I'll talk about that later when when we get to that fight, but. The kid to share, you thought to yourself, at any time, if you stand your ground, let your hands go, like you did a, a couple times in that fight, I think he could honestly, I think he could have ended that fight by, by knockout. He could have stopped Adamas by a knockout. Because when he stood his ground and let his hands go, that right hook that was landing, he was hurting the kid. But anyways, um, you know, props and, and you know, congratulations to him. He's he's uh, technically a, a world champion in waiting. And probably very, very soon we're going to see him elevated to, to champion status, um, yeah, and, and that interim tag will get knocked off. Now, now, how, now, as far as other people that are within that division, if we look at the other champions that are in the division with him and stuff, obviously you got Tony Harrison who's getting ready to defend the title in the rematch against uh, Charlo, and then yeah, Jay Rock. and then the other champion you obviously got J Rock, you know, who upset uh, Jared Hurd. Um, how do you see Chisera matching up against either one of those guys? Any of them. I got to be honest with you. I, uh, well, Tony Harrison. I. I mean, I don't. I. I. I still haven't seen enough of his fights, but I. I think either of those guys beats Teixeira. I. I do. I think Teixeira, especially with the way he cuts and the way he. Um, he. Um, you know, he puffs up and bleeds around his. Uh, around his eyes. Um, I think J Rock right now is kind of coming into his own. I think that. I don't think. I think J Rock stops him, but. Maybe Harrison, maybe it's a little bit more competitive of a fight, maybe. But J-Rock looked really good in, in fighting that big 154-pounder Jared Hurd and taking those shots and landing big punches and hurting oh, her and even dropping her. Yeah, not, yeah up, dropping, dropping a big guy who was actually, I mean, like I said, I mean, next to Mugia, you know, two big, two biggest guys probably in the division. They're the two biggest guys at that division, yeah. But Jared Hurd actually might even be bigger than Honey. Yeah, Jared and, Hurd is a big boy. Well, we saw him over at Staples. Remember for thing, and he he was a big boy. He was a big guy. Yeah, so I mean, he, um, but the thing is, I I think you're absolutely right. I think it was a, a very well calculated move by uh, Golden Boy putting Tashera, being that Tashera's under the Golden Boy banner, so he loses oh he is under Golden Boy. Yeah, yeah, he is under Golden Boy. So he loses a champion in Mungia moving up to middleweight. But then he gets that, still keeps that title with Chishera filling the vacancy. So yeah, uh, well, yeah. You know, so, it's, so it's a good move on. It's a so they still have, they still have some options at one fifty four. Exactly, you know. So I mean, but as far as him being competitive, I mean, he's always going to be competitive. He's a tough guy. Um, I just haven't seen a whole lot of progress in Chisera as far as um, in his earlier fights in his career. When I saw him fighting, he seemed to um, he he seemed a more powerful fighter. Um, he seems to me uh, like he's kind of, he still throws in, in, in volume, but he's become very um, vulnerable in the sense, especially with his skin. I mean, he cuts on almost every fight. And he's taken, maybe it's just the accumulation of punches, because like you say, if you go back to the to the Rodriguez fight, the fight part of this one, he took just a numerous amount of punches. So, I mean, um, the thing is, is that his, his opportunities against J-Rock, I don't see any opportunity there at all. I know people are gonna say, "Well, J Rock's got a suspect chin." Well, you know, he got caught, you know, with a good shot from Charlo in his fight and stuff. But he's recovered, and believe me, those shots that Jared yeah, Hurd was and, dropping and, and off Charlo, the and Char Charlo, both Charlos have, have a decent punch. So yes, they do. Yes, they do. Now it's they're big kids. For, they're big kids for their divisions as well. So now Tony Harrison, on the other thing, on the other sense, I think Tony Harrison's advantage against Jacera is the fact that he's just he's just too slick for him. I think Tony Harrison just outboxes him, and Tony Harrison got popped. And the problem is, is that um, Adamus showed a, just he wasn't ready. He's still very, very novice. There was a lot of hype behind him, a lot of it coming from his trainer Robert Garcia and a lot of other people. But this kid, you got to look at his resume. Who's he fought? You know, he steps up against yeah. a guy that that you know got a winning record and you know has been in there with some good people. But the bottom line is, is that 
Adam showed you that right there that, like we talked about earlier, you can't just rely on a punch. And his punches aren't as hard as he thinks. He's not a Mungia level puncher. He's not even probably a, a Charlo level puncher. He just looks like he is, but he's really not. So there's going to be... Yeah, I mean, he's got the look. I mean, he's got, you know, he's, he's, he's put together. But yeah, that doesn't always translate into power. Yeah, so. exactly. So, I mean, I just didn't see it. I mean, you know, to me, Chisera isn't the most durable guy. So, I mean, the punches he was lining on Chisera, because I kept hearing the, the commentators were like, you know, it was so pro so pro Adamus and so against Chisera, it almost made you wonder, like, well, <laughs> but then at the end, they, everybody, you know, changed their, their opinion of the whole entire thing. But but at the end of the day... Well, like yeah. Said, well, well, yeah, you know what? And that, bring, that leads me to a point. I actually tweeted about it. I, I, I want to say it was around, I don't remember what round it was, but it was after the knockdown. It was after... Adamus had been knocked down by Teixeira, and Chris Algieri, obviously, I think he knows um, Adamus, or maybe he had trained alongside him at one point, but he he's a guy that, I mean, top rank, in my opinion, they really need to rethink who they're putting behind the microphone, because Chris Algieri is a walking, talking contradiction. Multiple times, he would say something, and 30 seconds later, he's saying something the exact opposite, to the point where the gentleman, now, I don't know who the other guy was, was that was with him, but he, he, he probably had this look on his face like, what? He, he made a comment. He said he said that Adamus, they, they talked about how the scoring could be going. And then um, Algeri says, well, you know, Adamus is, you know, he's clearly dominating the fight. 30 seconds later, he made this comment verbatim. He said when when the, the other gentleman was basically, you know, describing what Teixeira was doing. And Algeri said Teixeira was fighting a brilliant fight. OK, how do you fight a brilliant fight? But 30 seconds ago, you were being dominated. Nobody who fights a brilliant fight is dominated. <laughs> it just doesn't make any sense. But like then again, like I said, you know, I I think I think Chris Algieri gets in his own way. I think that he thinks he's so smart, and he thinks he, because maybe his his um his background in, as a nutritionist or, or whatever, but he he talks like he, he he talks himself out of reality, or he he basically how do I say it? He so I sound like a retard right now, but <laughs> no, no, I, I know, I know, I know what you're saying. He, but he's he, he's, he's trying too hard to sound too smart. hard to sound like he knows and what he's too hard about. to be to be an analyst, and he's not. He's, he's not just either. not that. Well, he was very, problem, like I said, he was very Chris pro Algeri dominant. Is, Chris Algeri the barely knows how to be a fighter. He's a to me, honestly, Chris Algieri is a guy who who came from a if I believe more of like a kickboxing or or whatever he was involved in. I don't know background and um. He got some opportunities. The bottom line is this. Bottom line is this. I'm not taking nothing away from Algeria because he's a fighter and I respect fighters. But when he, the 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 what put him in line to even fight for a world title was that robbery against Provodnikov. Oh, absolutely. He did not. He did not win that fight. No. That no. was a that was a New York State hometown decision. Everybody was shocked in that fight. I think Algeria included. He did not win that fight. Well, but there then was again, you know, emotional push behind him. If you remember, Kobe there was. Too. Algeria's a good-looking guy. Rushan looks like, you know, the guy who sells, you know, bricks and rocks on the corner and stuff. You know I mean? It's like it's not, <laughs> not going to work that way. I mean, one guy, one guy's eye candy and the other one's, you know, the, the candy that's old and you hide in the back of the refrigerator. But it, it is what it is. But, yeah. you know, Chris Algeria, So anyway, so the, so that, that that's the last thing I'll, yeah. we'll say about that, that fight. Yeah, but, you know, so like I said, that, that, that was one again, even more exciting fight. What I thought, well, exciting in the sense that he's back. But not exciting in the sense of who they matched him against. So go ahead. Yeah. Well, the next fight we're talking about is um, it was fought at a catch weight, so is right in between featherweight and junior lightweight. Uh, Carl Frampton uh, won a ten round decision over this kid Tyler McCreary. Uh, they went ten rounds. Um, I thought Frampton, you know, he dropped the kid a couple times with body shots. I thought Frampton looked good. He was very workmanlike. He looked very comfortable after about a round or two. But in the first round or two, I thought to myself, well, this kid could give him some issues because of the, the range and his length. He was longer, taller. But Frampton did what he said he was going to do. He said, I'm going to go out there and out-jab this kid. And most people probably thought, how are you going to out-jab somebody who's got an eight-and-a-half-inch reach advantage on you? But he, damn if he sure didn't out-jab that kid. And, <clears throat> and um. I mean, it was just very workmanlike. I think Carl Frampton looked great. I think 130 might be his plateau. I couldn't see him going any higher than that. Yeah. Because he's not a big guy. What is Frampton? Five foot five? Uh, Frampton's five five. Not, yeah, barely five six. Yeah, barely he's, five foot five. So he's not tall. But he's proving and, he's, uh, he's proving he's can, he can be beating 
this kid, and then his victory over Leo Santa Cruz proves he can fight guys who are bigger. He has a ability. No, yeah, absolutely. You know, yeah. So Long, longer, longer, because Frampton is thicker than most guys he fights because he's short, but he is <coughs> his stature. He is and the commentating too. I mean, honestly, that was probably the most verbal I've seen Timothy Bradley and Andre Ward get into it, man. And well, Tim you can see, you can see. Okay, I knew from the minute those fighters were in the ring during the introductions, I knew right away Andre Ward was made, over made, here. And this is this, huh? Yeah. He, he well, not only was he former career, but you can see that he's he's got some promotional ties with him yeah. because you saw James Prince standing that, there next to McCreary, and you yeah. know Andre Ward is also managed by James Prince. And that's so what a lot of people don't know. A lot of people don't know that. I'm glad you're you're exposing that. You know. Well, that's well, that's a, that's the thing. <clears throat> where, where I think, in my opinion, that's a conflict of interest. Yeah, you don't need to have somebody because Andre Ward all but got up in the corner and worked the corner for the kid because what he was talking. It's one thing to break down what you think a fighter needs to do to win. He was actively cheerleading for this kid oh, yeah. throughout the entire fight. And I think Timothy Bradley was just kind of fed up. He was just kind of frustrated. I right actually here. liked what Timothy Bradley said. There was a point where, you know, when he, you know, you know when, when, um, when Timothy Bradley starts calling Andre Ward Andre rather than Dre, he's getting mad. And he was literally getting mad because he felt like Andre Ward was kind of like disrespecting what Frampton was doing and was making excuses for what <coughs> McCurry wasn't doing. I don't know, you know, a lot of people have been saying Andy Reese is flashy. He, he bought this house and this car and this car and this party and stuff. I don't know about all that, but just based on what I, what I can see, um, it looks like AJ really, um, from the moment he lost that fight, he probably had about a day's worth of rest and he was right back in the gym. Obviously not sparring right away because he was slightly concussed in that first fight back on June 1st. But um, Anthony Joshua, I think he's a bit of a man on a mission right now. I think he feels a little bit embarrassed. And I'm not saying embarrassed to lose to lose a fight, but maybe embarrassed to lose to a late substitute who just fought a couple of weeks prior. And you know, he's you know, he's this guy, he's 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 a bit egotistical, he's he had considered the elite heavyweight, you know, the, the the an Adonis type physique where he, he feels a little bit embarrassed that he got this 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 chubby, you know, tattooed Mexican American, you know, <laughs> drop him four times and take his titles. But um so based on that, I, I mean, I'll just make a quick prediction. I think Anthony Joshua wins this rematch. I'm not going to say how he wins it. He could pound out a decision. He could knock out Andy Reese. But I, I just think, I don't think he's going to let himself um, suffer the same fate as he did back in June. I agree. So. I, I, I agree, bro. Um, I think um, Anthony Joshua, it all starts with himself. It starts in how he wants to be looked upon for the rest of his boxing career. And he's got a he's got a big hill to, to climb in the sense of not so much Andy Reese, it's himself, and where he's at mentally going into this fight. He's got to yeah. stop listening to the people, you know. What his his walk into the Pantheons and walking into Madison Square Gardens was here comes Superman. He has to put all that bullshit aside and go back to being a fighter, like I've said before, you know, back to basics and understand that he's the better fighter. Technically, in all aspects, he's a better fighter. Um, he's a better conditioned fighter. He should be. He's the you know he's a fighter that's gone farther. That was has the better amateur pedigree. He's a former gold medalist. But the, for some reason, you know Anthony Joshua, like I said, he just when it happens in boxing, you start listening to people and you become this start other person. Start placing the hype. Yeah, and and it what Anthony Joshua can't let happen is what Andy Reese was able to turn this fight into last time, and that's a street fight. He has to remember yeah. he's a very well-schooled boxer. Be a boxer. Use your height. Use your reach. Use your physical advantages over Andy Reese. Make him reach for you. Don't come to him. Okay. Let him come to you, and, let, and then when he is coming at you, make him reach for you. That will then exploit those spots that you need and put Andy Reese to sleep. So well, I, I, I I agree because obviously it, obviously Andy Reese Andy Reese is gonna 
he's going to think, well, you know what? I'm going to follow the same format I did in the first fight. I'm going to go at this guy and test yeah. his chin. And like I said, um, he he's vulnerable. Andy Ruiz got got dropped pretty hard in that fight by that left hook. He just got a decent chin. I mean, he was able to withstand that knockdown and come back yeah. and if later you, in that if round. If you don't want to chime in on that right there, bro. Um, if you get a chance, go back and watch that when Anthony Joshua knocked him down. I want you to look at the punch that Joshua landed. And I don't think Andy Reese he realizes this, is that Joshua, that was an arm punch. He really didn't step into it. If you really look at it, he was on his back foot. Back foot and just when, up and, when, and, when Anthony Joshua lands a real hook or a real right or a real left on Andy Reese, not, you know, discombobulated, it's going to be a whole other story. And I think it's going to happen quick because I think Andy Reese is going to go in there and think, I'm going to do, like you said, I'm going to go in there and I'm just going to test his chin. I'm going to take this guy out early and look devastating. And he's going to find out real quick. You know what I'm saying? I mean, that's the way I look at it. No, no, I, I agree. I think, um, like I said, I think um, he's a bit, like I said, he's a bit embarrassed. I think he, he is a superior athlete. Um, maybe, you know, Andy Reese. I think still even with, with An Anthony Joshua, they said he, he's going to come in significantly lighter. He's going to try to increase his speed. Ultimately, ultimately, losing weight doesn't help your speed that much. It, no. it doesn't. Some people think it does, and it, it really doesn't. It's just a matter of maybe a little bit more fleet-footed. You know, maybe be able to. You know, he's got a conditioning issue, though. A A AJ, he has gassed in fights. I mean, he he gassed Big against Dillian White. Um, he gassed against uh, Vladimir Klitschko, but then was able to get a second win and then rebound and win that fight. But um. But you got to remember this too, and I'm not I'm not claiming to be like a nutritionist or something, but a lot of times when a person gasses out, their bodies start eating inside of themselves like this, you know, and Andy Reese had that fat that helped him. I'm going to hate to say it. That extra thickness that he had, that layer, those extra coats, whatever you want to call it, helped absorb some of those big early body shots that Anthony Joshua landed on him. It's not going to be the case in this fight. You know what I'm saying? He's not going to have those layers, you know? He was never that fleet of foot in the first place. To me, he's not, you know, a, a guy who's got great footwork. You know, he kind of stands his ground. At the weight he was at before, he was able to do that. Coming in much lighter and giving a physical advantage even more to Anthony Joshua, to me, was the wrong game plan. Yeah, and I think I think Teddy Atlas said the same thing. Freddie Roach said the same thing. They just they kind of like Andy Reese to just stay stay the way he was you know andy be andy don't don't try to change overnight because you whatever you did that first fight worked but but we'll see like i said i, I don't think i don't think this fight's going to be remnant this of the first fight at all no i, I don't think that. it's going to be this this four four round slugfest whatever it was their first fight. i don't think that i think it's going to be more tactical and i think anthony's going to box more move more use his jab get out or keep his distance maybe try to keep Anthony. Uh, reset bay with the jab and then like you said eventually Andy's gonna try to make it a fight and try to make it ugly and come at him and that's when I think he can catch him he can counter him and, and catch him and hurt him and I think if he catches him hurt him this time he's gonna do a lot like the Filipino kid did against um Tete he's gonna be calculating he's not just gonna go in there guns blazing with his chin wide open because that's what happened in the first fight yeah. he's gonna be more calculated he there might be a moment where he hurts Andy Reeves maybe drops Andy and lets him off the hook you know because maybe he's a little he's gonna be a little bit tentative but you know but you know, you know the thing is, is I look at it this way: if Anthony Joshua goes in there and fights for the one person and one person only, fights for himself, doesn't fight to help Eddie Hearn in, in his promotion, doesn't fight for anything, even doesn't even fight for the UK. He's got to go in there and, like I said, use his physical advantage. His physical advantage is his size, his height, his pedigree, his speed. I know Andy Reese has got so, those things on his side too, but in a different in a different level, but. Right now, Andy Reese is, is thinking, Anthony Joshua, I've had tougher fights than Anthony Joshua. Joseph Parker in his head was tougher than Anthony Joshua. You know, yeah. um, guys like, um, like um, uh, what's his name? I, I can't remember the other guy he, he fought. Um, the other, um, Molina. Big Rush? No, no, uh, Eric Molina, when he fought Eric Molina, was tougher oh. than Anthony Joshua. The, the point yeah. is, um, Anthony Joshua lost that fight before he even stepped in the ring. Because Anthony Joshua wasn't concentrated or focused on Andy Reese. Anthony Joshua was there to keep, to to kind of like be his premiere show for the U.S. You know, and, and it doesn't really matter. I mean, it's up to Anthony Joshua. If he goes in there and does that bullshit again, and he ends up losing this fight. I'm gonna say it. He'll still have a, a career, but it will not be. 
he would have not have, have completed the story that was supposed to be told about Anthony Joshua. He will just be an ordinary yeah. fighter. And I can see Anthony Joshua four or five years from now fighting a fight for top rank or whoever, or if he's still with his own, and getting knocked out by some upcoming guy like a like a like like a Dubois or one of these other guys coming up. You know what I'm saying? He'll be yeah, like yeah. what happened oh, to yeah. Frank Bruno, he'll be that sacrificial lamb. He'll turn into yeah. Audrey Harrison. And that's and that's sad. Audrey on the Harrison, yeah, yeah, yeah. And the thing is, I mean, so now on the other thing before we close out. If Andy Reese goes in there and does what he says he's going to do, and he beats Anthony Joshua, where does he go from here? Where does Andy Reese go from here? I, I think, I think from a business standpoint, right away they'll make they'll make an Andy Reese versus uh, Adam Kwanowski fight. Yeah, the will. Polish kid. I, I I don't think they're gonna. I don't think because because if the, if if what we're hearing is true, if Deontay Wilder and Fury is, they just said it's penciled for February twenty second. Um, is it in Las Vegas? Is it in Las Vegas this time? Last time it was in Los Angeles at Staples Center. We were there. This time it's going to be in Las Vegas, I believe. If that's true, I know it's going to be in the U.S. because Fury knows this is where he's going to make the money. Las yeah. Vegas. In Las Vegas. Okay. Yeah. So I could see it being in Las Vegas. I mean, his last two fights have been in Las Vegas. Um, where does Andy Reese go? I think a fight with Konoski is is. I think it's an exciting fight because similar style, similar body. Body styles, similar fighting styles. I mean, it could be an exciting fight. I mean, um, PBC keeps it in house. Both PBC fighters. Um, other than that, I really don't see where it goes. I don't see them putting Andy Reese against a like a Dillian White or any of these other guys. Because as far as I'm concerned, Dillian White hasn't done anything to to um, to even after he got popped for uh, what he was two two banned substances. He was found in his bloodstream, so he's fighting. I know on the undercard. Uh, of this fight, I don't know against two. I, I can't see them making that fight if uh, Dillian White versus Andy Reese. Well, I mean, that might be on paper that might be a good fight. I just, I just don't think it's lucrative enough for right. Andy Reese. Andy's going to go, this guy, I'm going to make $13 million fighting, uh, fighting a guy like uh, Anthony Joshua. I'm going to make what, maybe a, a fifth of that fighting Dillian White. He's not going to do it. Well, Andy Reese has got to understand too, he's not going to make, he's not going to make better money than he's going to make this Saturday. That's it. No. no, no other opponents out there, with exception to a, maybe a fight against Deontay Wilder, which he's pretty much. But even a Deontay Wilder fight won't pay him that. Yeah, it won't pay him that much money. He might as well just take his belt, put it in a nice wrapper and a box with a big bow, and just hand it to Deontay before the fight because it's gonna, it's not gonna go his way. You know, he uh, to me, no, he has no chance against. Uh, he's got a puncher's chance, but. The one thing that makes Deontay Wilder... If he Wilder, was a puncher, he'd have a puncher's chance. Exactly. But he's not a puncher. Yeah, he's and you're a, not going to tell me Andy Reese hits Joshua. harder than Luis Ortiz. <laughs> no, that's not happening. So, um, No. Tyson Fury will make a mockery of him, um, even though I don't think Tyson Fury looked very good in his last fight. Um, he'll, still, he'll still bounce, uh, he'll still bounce uh, box circles around Andy, Andy Reese. Yeah, and so, I mean, the thing is, is that... Um, the, the, the only yeah, that's fight, a fight. Just even just even the thought of that fight just gives me a headache. Yeah, it's like good good lord, what I want to see. Hell no, what I want to see that fight. No, I would just honestly, what I'd like to see happen with Andy Reese is if he does win the fight, he might get one title defense. It might be against um, Dubois. Um, that's a possibility. Um, is that am I saying his name right? Yeah, that Daniel Dubois. I, yeah. I, I, don't, I don't think that kid's quite ready for a title shot yet. Eddie, Eddie Hearn will have you believe that. Because well, Eddie Hearn's going to want to do it because I know the other person he's trying to spoon feed about a possible opponent for Andy Reese is Derek Chisora. Um, now, to me, honestly, you just, you just don't know what level Reese is really at. Because let's be honest, his fight against Joseph Parker, which is a close fight, and he did gas in that fight. But Parker, you know, to me is not a tremendous puncher. And... The one thing that Dillian White does have is he's a bigger puncher than 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 Joseph Parker, and I don't I wouldn't even put Cherik Chisora there too. So I mean that 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 vulnerability there with Andy, I just think Andy might get a fight against maybe one of these mid level guys, and then maybe just cash out against hopefully against Deontay or Tyson Fury, and that's it. That that's a, I mean I don't see where you really go from that point. No, yeah, yeah, I agree, I agree. Like I said, I um, you know. Six months from now, some in the in the summer, in the in the late summer, early fall of 2020, if if both guys come through unscathed, which I think, I don't think Andy is gonna. I, I just I don't see him getting past AJ this weekend. But if he does, 
I, I, I damn sure I could tell you right now, if I could go bet money right now in Vegas on Deontay Wilder, I'm going to do it because he's going to knock Tyson Fury out in the rematch. Oh, yeah. I promise you that. He is knocking Tyson Fury out oh, in yes. that rematch. And, Absolutely. Um, Deontay Wilder, it, it, it's like he does his homework in fight one, and fight two, he takes the test. He did he did the, to Stavern, Ortiz. He will do the same thing to Tyson Fury. I don't care how good of a boxer people think Tyson Fury is. He... Deontay Wilder does not get credit for getting better in these rematches. He does not give in credit because his power, his power is so expected now. It's uncontrolled. That he's going to knock somebody senseless. Yeah. That they completely ignore what he does in the rounds and minutes leading up to the knockout. They, they're forgetting that entirely. They're completely overlooking that. Go back and watch. Go back and watch. The Tyson Fury fight, the first fight. People, act, I watched it just just today. I watched that fight, and there were rounds where Tyson was feigning and moving and flicking punches and this and that, but but none of it was really landing. I think wow. when we were there, we were seeing yet yeah, Tyson's moving a lot, but he's not really landing anything on Deontay. You know what really and, confused me about the Tyson Fury Deontay fight when I went what Wilder fight when I back and watch it. I honestly don't think it was so much Fury. Out hustled Deontay or gave him a boxing lesson. I think Deontay was actually very confused by what was in front of him. If you look at Deontay on a lot of the rounds, it was almost kind of like he's looking at him. He's like, okay, so what do I do? It's like you know, because Tyson's very unorthodox and he's doing this, and Deontay looks like, okay, wait a minute, now I got to reset. It's like it just, and then the round was over. You know, it's just like he just never got his 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 motor running, and then he finally figured it out in the twelfth round. He he kind of like if you watch the twelfth round. Deontay had this look on his face where he was like, why am I still fighting this fight? And he just walks out there and throws that thing. Boom. It should have been over. And he was like, God damn, why didn't I do that a long time ago? You know, because it was yeah. there for the taking. And you're absolutely no, right. He was, I, I think he destroys Tyson Fury in a rematch. Um, I think he knocks him out in less than six rounds. I really I do. Leonard really Ellaby really said it. And I'm not quoting Leonard Ellaby because, yeah. but I tell you what, I just do not see Tyson Fury getting out of that fight. I don't. I think we got even a bigger problem, and this is starting to remind me of the early '80s. And this is pre-Tyson era, and we'll close out on this. Um, there was a there was a, a a point in boxing when we had multiple champions. At the time, it was Tim Witherspoon, Pinklin Thomas, and Trevor Burrick, and mm -hmm. these three guys systematically held onto these titles and fought everybody but each other. The only person, and I'm going to say it. The only person in the heavyweight division willing to fight anybody within the heavyweight division that includes the other champions is Deontay Wilder. I truly still have huge doubts if Tyson Fury, if this fight's going to happen with Deontay. I know they say it's going to. They're saying this is penciled. Until I see the actual poster up on the wall and the tickets being sold, I don't believe it. Do I see Andy Reese and his people, Manny Robles and those guys, going after uh, either one of those guys? No. So I see them. So I see Tyson Fury doing what he does. You know, against whoever, you know. I see Andy Reese out here fighting, you know, whatever, you know, um, you know, whatever fighter is, is available and um at a at a non threat level. And I see a frustrated Deontay Wilder get older and older and go, God damn it, man. All I want is these belts. And I can't get it. And I'm never gonna yeah. get the respect I deserve. He's the best heavyweight champion in the world. I think he's a true heavyweight champion, and I'm tired of hearing this bullshit about Mike Tyson. I wish Mike Tyson was 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 prime right now. I wish he was, yeah. because I would love to see that fight. You know what I'm saying? Because I'll tell you now, Mike Tyson had devastating power, but what I but I never saw Mike Tyson knock out a man like Luis Ortiz the way Deontay Wilder's knocking people out. I never seen. I mean, I I think to me the most devastating knockout Tyson pre you know pre you know not not his fights that were on ESPN Friday Night Fights, but I think is when he knocked out Trevor Burry. He 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 stiffened Trevor Burdick up. Yeah. But you talk but you talk about an old fighter and you talk about a fighter that was about eight years past his prime, that was Trevor Burbick. People talk about Lewis Ortiz being old. How old was Trevor Burbick when 44. he fought that fight? He, 40. he looked I don't know if he was forty four, but he looked a lot older than Luis Ortiz. And okay. I tell you this right now, he was not one half the boxer of Luis, Luis Ortiz is a very skilled boxer. I watched that fight with Robert Alcazar and he said it. That guy is a very skilled fighter. He's that guy is a very good fighter. That's why he was fighter. waiting to fight against Deontay. That's why Deontay was being cautious. That's why Deontay was waiting. But I just sit here and tell my wife the whole time, Deontay's setting him up. He's setting him up. I go, you watch. His hands are coming down. 
He gave him a little bit of of that position. Boom, man. It was it. Chess match. Yeah. Yeah. But great, great, great. great So you're right. You're right. I'll touch on that too. Deontay Wilder really, he does, he's got, but people forget though. Mike Tyson had haters at that time too. Mike Tyson was never be, was endearing to fans until he went through all his, you know, the, getting put in prison and the whole thing with Don King and Robin Gibbons and all that. But prior to that, people did not like Mike Tyson. They didn't like his antics. They hated Don King. They hated Mike Tyson with all his flash and his entourage. He was a heavyweight Floyd Mayweather. Well, and only yeah. only in the last decade, you know, did, did Mike Tyson become an endearing figure with his stand-up routine, you know, where he tells the stories and stuff. Now people are like, oh, Mike Tyson, was this Mike Tyson? But I don't remember Mike Tyson coming up. You remember Mike Tyson coming up. We remember, we remember all of his fights. I think we saw probably 90% of his fights so Mike coming Tyson up. fighting the amateurs. <laughs> yeah, so, so, you know. But, but, the, but the, point I, is, I, the point is, like what you're saying, you're absolutely right, bro. Um, they're always going to have haters, but the, but the thing is, like I said, with, with Mike Tyson especially, is the fact that um, you got to look at the level, of the quality of the opponents and stuff, and fighters are getting bigger and bigger. Mike Tyson was put in that same situation. The people from the UK kept clamoring and clamoring how Frank Bruno would destroy Mike Tyson. That fight finally happened, and you saw what happened. You know? Well, I think the exact same thing would happen if Anthony, let's just put it this way Anthony Joshua is damn lucky that he was not fighting Deontay Wilder June 1st of last year. Or, or I'm sorry, of this year. I think if Anthony, because if Anthony because if Deontay Wilder, Wilder hits him the way that Andy Reese hits him, oh. Anthony Joshua it, it never his career is over. He never fights again. Well, I think Anthony Joshua he's already got a sus, he's already got a suspect chin. He's already shown the propensity to be con, to be concussed. He's been dropped and hurt multiple times. Klitschko hurt him bad. Dillian White hurt him bad. Andy Reese knocked him down four times. Joseph Parker. God. Good Lord, what well, the hell? I think Anthony Joshua made, did himself a huge disservice not taking that fight against Deontay Wilder because it, his that was his best opportunity because it was a still developing Deontay Wilder. Deontay Wilder is getting more comfortable in his skin and who he is as a fighter and what he needs to do to win fights. At that point, there was still a lot of things that had to be fixed. He was still very hittable. He was out of position in a lot of ways. So if he had a chance at Anthony Joshua, that was his chance. Now, no, it's done. You have to, you have to understand. Too, this is what I was talking. About. I think we we even talked during that fight, and I said to myself, Deontay is boxing better than people give him credit for. But everybody's just expecting him to just unleash this barrage. But he hardly at, in that fight against Luis Ortiz, the second fight, he got tagged a couple times. You know, he got hit. I mean, but yeah. did anything significant really land? No, he was doing a good job of moving and. Basically, just mm. taking in, just inputting everything that he saw coming at him. I just, inputting, I didn't, inputting, I didn't inputting. like the way Deontay looked physically. The way his eyes, his his just the, this expression he had on his face. Yeah, he did. He looked. He looked a bit disinterested in this fight. Very, very, and that's all he, he looked does, a little disinterested. Yeah, very, very, yeah. Almost like he did. He looked a little bit like he looked a little bit shell shocked. But like I said, maybe, maybe, maybe that was a ploy. Maybe that was that's what to thinking. give. To give Ortiz that sense of self-confidence. He was did. playing a possum a little bit. But what a lot of people don't understand is, explain real quick, Mike, the punch that Deontay landed on Luis Ortiz and the position that Ortiz head in, how was that impact harder than in a natural progression? You know well, saying? because he turned in, he turned his head into the punch. Correct. Well, he turned into understand. it. He just made that, he made that one little movement of the head and bam. He, so it was like, so now like that people have to question forward. this. Remember what what was that that movie that they said? Um, you ever see that movie um, uh, 13th Warrior with Antonio Banderas? No. Well, there, there's a scene real quick, and it's going to make a sense of this, and I don't mean to get off, where this old guy, this old Viking is fighting against this big monstrous Viking, and he's losing, and they go, they keep going at each other, and it's, he's down to no more shields. And then all of a sudden, he just makes this quick little move and chops the other guy's head off. And then Antonio Banderas, he's all, you could have done that at any time. He's all, yeah. He's also, why didn't you? He's all, he's all, it's not what they thought I could do. Now they have to calculate what I know beyond that. So now we have to think, where's Deontay Wilder's ring IQ? It's a lot higher than we think it is. And that makes it exactly. more dangerous. That's what I'm saying. That's what I'm saying. People are not giving Nobody's him the credit that. for getting Nobody's better in that. these fights. They're not giving him the credit no, for getting right, better in these fights. 
So that's a great movie. You know, it is like it is like Deontay Wilder's getting hit and getting hit. Because as far as I know, the best two punches he's ever been hit with was was that first Ortiz fight when he got hit with punches that would have knocked out Andy Reese, Anthony Joshua, Tyson Fury, and he took them and walked back to his corner, mad at himself. Comes back the next round and just goes on the attack. So, like I said, he's 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 really not getting the credit he deserves. Could you imagine if Deontay Wilder was Anthony Joshua and had been dropped by Klitschko, hurt by Dillian White, holding on for dear life and all this stuff? That was not happening. And Dillian White is no Luis Ortiz. Dillian White is a, what does he have, 11 amateur fights? And he fights every bit like he's only had 11 amateur well, fights. Well, if you notice, too, after that fight happened, I didn't see a lot of people jumping online or, you know, the big Twitter war going on. Well, D- D- Dillian was running his mouth. Well, he, Dillian runs his mouth to everybody. That's because there's no opportunities out there for him. He's there's got, nothing he's, for him out there. He's got nobody out there to fight. He's probably going to fight um, Robert Delaney. Sort of, yeah. <laughs> you know, you know, but... Uh, Hey, great, great, great discussion tonight, bro, man. And uh, I look forward yeah. to those fights. And when we get together, we'll, we'll watch the fights this week. And then uh, we got practice again. We'll do, we'll do a post, we'll do a post fight breakdown uh, Saturday. Maybe we'll do it um, Sunday, Sunday morning or something. But we do, we do need to get together. And maybe do a thing. Let's do a little take on. Um, I'd like to do a take one day on some of these uh, commentators and some of the reps and stuff. And because it just it really, um, it just, it's just really starting to get to me because obviously. Oh wait a minute! Um, no, no, TF Primo's not this week. He's the following week, right? The no, he's, he's the following the fourteenth. So that's gonna be a big week. The fourteenth, TF Yeah, there's and, a couple um, good fights that week. Yeah, a lot so of good we'll fights. On All right, well, hey, great night tonight. Like I said, uh, everybody, um, follow us on on Facebook at Enter the Ring Show. Um, go to our YouTube and uh, subscribe to our channel, even though we really don't care all that much about YouTube, but it is what it is. <laughs> and um, <laughs> you know, give me another strike. I don't care. You know. YouTube gives me our website. Our, our website enter the ring buzz. Yeah, go to our. our ring. It's still under development, but it's getting better and better. And like I said, um, anybody who's out there, if you know a fighter that's in a gym or something that you'd like to be, you know, to get showcased and 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 talk with us, I mean, we're always open to that kind of stuff. Or if you don't agree with us, send us a message. We love to discuss it. You know, maybe we'll get you on here and you can talk with us. Send it to it. Yeah, at, you can call in with us. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. At info at enter the ring buzz. Once again, you know, it's enter the ring with. Mighty Mike, AJ Rage. Everybody have a wonderful night tonight. Later on, bro. Talk to you tomorrow. Have a good week. Bye. Bye.